So I'm teaching complex analysis right now, and I had my students work out this problem in class today, which after looking at it, I thought would be probably pretty interesting to make a video about. Maybe before we jump into it, I'd like to point out, which I do from time to time, that I have a second channel where I post videos for my courses. It's called Math Major, and it's linked in the description, building a whole course of complex analysis right now. Okay, so our goal here is to find the size of the modulus of cosine of z squared. Well, really we want to know the modulus of cosine of z, but we're just going to square it so that everything kind of looks nice. And I'd like to point out here that this is a complex variable. So if we're looking at a real variable, we know that it has to lie between negative 1 and 1. So will that be the same thing with a complex variable? Well, let's find out. But in order to do that, we need to figure out what do we mean by cosine evaluated at a complex number in the first place. And we can come up with a good idea for what that means by starting with Euler's formula. So let's recall that Euler's formula says e to the i theta is equal to cosine theta plus i times sine theta. Okay. But now if we switch theta with minus theta, that gives us e to the minus i theta is cosine of negative theta, but cosine is an even function, so that's the same thing as cosine of theta. And then minus i sine theta, and that's because sine is an odd function, so when we compose it with minus theta, we can bring that out. But now, since we want to solve for cosine, maybe we could add these two. Notice when we add these two, we get e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta equals two times cosine theta. And all while we're doing this calculation, we're pretty much assuming that theta is a real variable. But let's notice that at this stage, we can plug in theta to be a complex variable and then make some meaning out of the cosine of theta. And that's because we know the meaning of e to a complex number. Okay, so let's do that. So now we could say that cosine of z is equal to e to the i z minus e to the minus i z. I should say plus e to the minus i z all over 2, where I just divide that 2 over. So I replaced my theta with z, replaced that real angle variable with a complex variable. And then after that, I solved for cosine of z. Okay, nice. So this is what we're going to take as our maybe representation of the cosine evaluated at a complex number or a complex variable. Okay, so maybe before we dive into this, let's find cosine of a certain number, maybe just for fun. Let's find maybe cosine of i. See what that is. So that's going to be equal to e to the i times i because we're replacing z with i and then plus e to the minus i times i, because again, we're placing i with i all over two. But notice this is gonna be e to the minus one plus e to the one over two. That's because i times i is negative one, and thus negative i times i is positive one. But this is actually pretty interesting because this is exactly the hyperbolic cosine evaluated at one. And that gives you a really nice relationship between the regular trigonometric functions and the hyperbolic trigonometric functions. Maybe we could do one more just like kind of for fun. Let's maybe do the cosine of 1 plus 2i, for instance. So that's going to be e to the i times 1 plus 2i plus e to the minus i 1 plus 2i all over 2. So let's see what we get for that. So multiplying this i through will give us e to the i times e to the minus 2. I used exponent rules to bring that apart and the fact that i squares to negative 1. And then here we'll have plus e to the minus i and then e to the 2 all over 2. Okay, then we need to really think about what e to the i is. 
But notice that that is exactly this e to the i theta thing where theta is equal to one. So that means we can take this guy right here and this guy right here and use Euler's formula to write it in terms of kind of more well-known functions. So this is gonna give us the cosine of one plus i times the sine of one times e to the minus two plus the cosine of negative one, which is the same thing as the cosine of one, and then minus i times the sine of one, and then times e squared, and then this is all over two. So we have something that looks a little bit like that. But now we could gather the real parts and the imaginary parts, and maybe something starts to look nice. So let's see, the real parts are given by this cosine of one term multiplied by e to the minus two, this cosine of one term multiplied by e squared. So in the end, that'll give me the cosine of one over two times, let's see, we have e to the minus two um, plus e to the two. So something like that. And then what do we have for this sine term or this imaginary part? So that would be like combining this with this. So that's going to be plus i and then we'll have the sine of one over two and then we'll have e to the, let's see, minus two minus e to the 2 all over 2. So something that looks like that. Okay, next up we can maybe move this 2 inside here and observe. Well, let's maybe bring this up here. So move this 2 inside here and notice that we have the cosine of 1 times the hyperbolic cosine of 2. So that's what we get for this first term and then plus i times the sine of one, and then moving, oh, I got ahead of myself and moved the two in there, and then I think that's gonna be the hyperbolic sine of negative two. So the hyperbolic sine of negative two, but maybe I'll write it as two with a minus sign here on the i, just to make it look a little bit nicer. So I think that's a pretty nice structure here for the cosine of one plus two i as, the cosine of one, hyperbolic cosine of two, minus i times the sine of one and the hyperbolic sine of two. Okay, so now that being said, let's maybe find the modulus, modulus squared of some sort of arbitrary complex variable z. So now we're nice and warmed up with complex values of the cosine function and we're ready for this. So let's first start looking at the cosine of z and let's set z equal to x plus i y. So in other words like x is equal to the real part of z and such and so y is equal to the imaginary part of z. So that's our setup for getting off the ground here. Okay, so that's going to give us something like this, e to the i times z, but that's x plus i y, plus e to the minus i times z, but then again, that's x plus i y. Then this is going to be all over, let's see, we'll have 2 because that's in our formula. And now let's decompose this the same way that we did in our, in our special case. It's actually going to be pretty much the same, except we're going to use x instead of one and y instead of two. Okay, so this is gonna be e to the i x and then e to the minus y. So we get that by distributing this i through using the fact that i squares to negative one. And here we'll have e to the minus i x and then e to the y. Okay, great. And now this is all over two, but maybe just to keep things looking a little bit shorter, I'll put this all like multiplied by one half. Okay, now where can we go from here? We'll do the same thing that we did before. We'll expand this guy, this e to the i x, using our Euler's formula over here. So that's going to give us a half. And then we have this e to the i x is the cosine of x plus i times the sine of x. And then we have that multiplied by e to the minus y. And here we'll have plus 
cosine of x minus i sine of x, where I again use the fact that the sine is an odd function while the cosine is an even function, just like I did right here, times e to the y. So we're left with something like that. Now let's split this into real and imaginary parts. So notice the real part will take this cosine, this e to the minus y, this cosine, and this e to the y. Whereas the imaginary part will take this sine along with e to the minus y, and this sine along with this e to the y. So let's see what that leaves us with. We have one half, and then the real part has a common factor of cosine. We can bring that out. We have cosine of x. And then after factoring the cosine of x out, we have e to the y plus e to the minus y from this attachment right here and this attachment right here. And then notice the imaginary part. Maybe we could factor a minus i out, just kind of looking ahead to what we did before. Then we can factor a sine out of that whole thing. So we have sine of x. And then from there, we have e to the y minus e to the minus y. Okay, so this is looking quite good, I would say. Now from here, I'd like to multiply this one half through. So maybe I'll just like erase this one half and I'll put this over two and this over two. And then recognize this as the hyperbolic cosine and this is the hyperbolic sine. So in the end, we have the cosine of x and then the hyperbolic cosine of y and then minus i times the sine of x and then the hyperbolic sine of y. So that's our value for the cosine of z, nice and split up into the real part and the imaginary part. And now we can use that to easily find the modulus squared. So this is essentially where we ended the last board, but what I've done is I've taken my modulus squared and replaced cosine of z with what we found out it was in terms of its real part and imaginary part. And now let's recall that the modulus squared of a complex number, maybe we'll write it here. So the modulus of a plus bi squared is a squared plus b squared. That's going to be the same for a minus bi squared too as well, just given the fact that the modulus squared is equal to the complex number times its conjugate. Okay, so that means we can easily calculate the modulus squared of this thing just by doing the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. So that leaves us with cosine squared of x and then hyperbolic cosine squared of y plus sine squared of x and then hyperbolic sine squared of y. Now, if you're happy with that, you can leave it there, although there's some simplification that can be done. What we'd like to do is break it up into something where we just, instead of having a product of functions, we've just got a sum of functions. So how could we do that? Well, we'd like to use the fact that cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to one, whereas hyperbolic cosine squared minus hyperbolic sine squared is equal to one. So that is our motivation for including this version of zero. So I'll start by subtracting the cosine squared times the hyperbolic sine squared of x and y respectively, and then I need to add it back in as well because I want nothing to change. So I'll add back in the cosine squared times the hyperbolic sine squared of y. Now I can split this into parts. So I'll group this bit with this bit, and then I'll group this sine squared hyperbolic sine squared with this cosine squared hyperbolic sine squared. And then I'll factor out as possible. So let's notice from this first bit, I can factor out a cosine squared, whereas from this second bit, I can factor out a hyperbolic sine squared. So that's going to leave me with the cosine squared of x times the hyperbolic cosine squared of x minus the hyperbolic sine squared of y, I should say. And then plus, I've got the hyperbolic sine squared of y factored out. 
and then I have cosine squared x plus sine squared x. And then, like I said before, these are two well-known identities. One is a trigonometric identity, and the other one is a hyperbolic trigonometric identity. So this gives us the number one. This also gives us the number one. So that finally finishes this off in what I would say is the simplest form, which is the cosine squared of x plus the hyperbolic sine squared of y. And if you don't want to see x's and y's, but you only want to see z's in here, maybe you would write this as the cosine squared of the real part of z plus the hyperbolic sine squared of the imaginary part of z. And that's a good place to stop.